Thank you for joining us today for the FAST and ASF hosted webinar with Ovid Therapeutics. Um, today we welcome Dr. Amit Rakit. Hello, Dr. Rakit. Hey, how are you, Paula? Good, how are you? Good, thanks. Um, I think many members of the community are familiar with uh, Dr. Matthew During and Dr. Jeremy Levin, um, but I think you're new on the scene, so if you could just tell the community a little bit about yourself and your role within the Ovid therapeutics organization, that would be great. Sure, that's great. Um, so thanks for that uh, introduction. And uh, well, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Amit Rakit. I am the chief medical officer and chief portfolio officer here at Ovid Therapeutics. Um, I joined here about four months ago. Uh, my uh, background is I'm a pediatric cardiologist by training. I used to be on staff at Boston Children's Hospital on the transplant service. Uh, but that was many years ago. I left for the pharmaceutical industry um, about 17 or so years ago, started at Bristol Myers Squibb, and did many of the development programs for a drug called Plavix um, in adults as well as in pediatrics, and then moved to Biogen for the last five years, where I've been working on um, rare diseases such as ALS, or Lou Gehrig's disease, uh, as well as the SMA program, uh, with, which is a partnership with Ionis Pharmaceuticals, and recently joined Ovid to help run the uh, program here for Angelman Syndrome and Fragile X. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, we're, we, uh, FAST and the ASF put together a list of questions that we think may help the community start learning more about the upcoming trial. Uh, we have about 19 questions to start with. We're going to see how many we get through in the next half hour, and then if you, Dr. Rakit, would be gracious enough to join us for follow-up webinars as we get closer to the trial. That would be great. Great. Okay. Okay. Eileen, do you want to start with the first question? Yes. Um, thank you very much, Paula. I'm um, very excited uh, for both of our groups to be hosting this meeting. And um, the first question that I have for Dr. Rakit is, for those of us that aren't quite as familiar with um, OV101, um, can you please tell us what it is and how does it work? Sure, great. So uh, let me start by saying, so uh, Ovid, and, and many of you know Ovid Therapeutics, but uh, really what we're trying to do is um, develop bold medicines to transform the lives of people who live with rare neurological diseases. And one of our first areas that we're looking at are, is Angelman syndrome. And the first compound that we're looking at is OV101. So OV101 is an investigational compound uh, that's being studied for the potential treatment for Angelman syndrome. It's part of a class of compounds called GABA-A receptor agonists. Um, OV101 is a known um, uh, uh, is a known delta-specific agonist for this particular receptor. So the delta subunit is a particular part of this receptor in um, neurons and in your, your brain uh, that uh, modulates something called tonic inhibition. And tonic inhibition is something that's thought to be affected in patients and people with Angelman syndrome. Um, so we're hoping that OB101 can potentially modulate that effect and have an effect that will actually uh, improve the lives of people living with Angelman syndrome. Okay, Dr. Keith, um, why does Ovid believe this intervention being tested might be effective, and has it been tested before? Yeah, that's a great question. So, of course, we wouldn't move into studies in people until we had some confidence that we would actually um, be uh, looking at something that could potentially have uh, effects um, uh, in Angelman syndrome. So, uh, OB101 has been studied in preclinical models, so in animal studies. Uh, and in those models, uh, we've seen that OB101 can uh, restore certain functions of the neurons or, or brain cells. And this includes activities such as tonic inhibition, which I just spoke about that uh, may be affected in uh, Angelman syndrome. It looks like it has effects on how the neurons uh, mature, um, and so their uh, maturation is something that's potentially affected. It also has effects on sleep architecture and how uh, the mechanics of sleep, and that can have effects on cognition or thinking uh, as well as memory. Uh, previously, before moving into Angelman syndrome, uh, OB101 was studied in a pretty significant program for uh, adults with insomnia. Now, we have data in over 3,000 um, uh, people with insomnia 
uh, who were adults. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Rakit, can you tell us how is OB101 administered? Uh, so great question. So OB101, currently we have, they're in capsules, so they're oral, um, they're oral capsules, um, which people have to swallow. Okay. Um, Dr. Rakit, what would be the potential side effects of OB101? Yeah, so uh, good question. So if anybody ever says a medicine doesn't have a side effect, they're not telling you the truth. So all, all medicines have some sort of effect. Um, um, so I kind of prefer to call them adverse effects is what you're most likely interested in. So adverse effects are uh, effects that you know, don't necessarily want to occur when you're taking a specific medication or treatment. Um, in uh, our adult studies that we have data on already, which I mentioned, uh, there are some uh, very rare effects, but there are more common effects as well, as well. And more common effects are those effects that occur in more than 2% of people taking the medication or treatment. And for OB101, those include um, headache, dizziness, um, nausea, vomiting, and sleepiness. So Dr. Rakit, during the trial, who will be responsible for monitoring the side effects? Yeah, that's a good question too. So in all our clinical trials, we definitely want to make sure that safety is paramount and most important for us. So there is a team that actually looks at data continuously and the study overall in a continuous fashion. So first of all, it's the team at Ovid, and we have a, a good clinical team that has uh, people of various backgrounds, um, clinicians like myself, um, uh, operational folks who understand how clinical trial operations work. Uh, we have um, experts on the regulatory side as well as safety uh, um, experts as well. So at the Ovid side, we'll be looking at data uh, continuously. Uh, we also work with a contract research organization, so a CRO, uh, who will be managing more site operations and logistics. So they also will be monitoring data continuously. Um, and also then we have a clinical trial steering committee which has an overarching view of patient safety and oversight. So Dr. Ricky, who will oversee the participant's medical care while he or she participates in the trial? Right, so, um, so uh, a person's regular medical care for routine care will be your regular health care provider. Um, for uh, the study, if you're participating in the study, it's the study investigator who will oversee study-related activities. Now, sometimes that may be the same person. You may be going to your routine healthcare provider who's also the investigator. Of course, that'll be the same. Uh, but many times, um, the study investigator may be somebody different. And so they'll be monitoring and uh, overseeing study-related activities, um, but you'll go to your regular uh, health care provider uh, for routine care. So then as the parent of a participant in the trial, then what would the parent's responsibility be during the trial? Yeah, so um, as a parent and a caregiver, uh, really we're asking uh, you to you know, help us uh, do the best thing for the study is, is being able to comply with the study visits. Um, sometimes they seem a little uh, onerous, I guess, or maybe too many visits, but they're there for a reason. Uh, we really want to make sure that uh, we're assessing people every stage along the way, both from seeing if it works from an efficacy perspective, but really the safety perspective. We want to make sure that um, your best interests are in mind. So being able to comply with the um, scheduled study visits, being able to comply with the questionnaires that we're asking for, um, and also um, uh, for uh, for caregivers who have their their child living at home with them, uh, we're asked we're actually monitoring sleep. Uh, so we're asking as a, a part of the study for caregivers to wear um, a watch, which actually helps monitor uh, sleep and how well you're sleeping um, in connection with the study uh, and 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 um, living uh, with with your child with Angelman syndrome. Excellent. Um, you had mentioned an overarching uh, committee, a steering committee, uh, that will be monitoring the trial. Who will be on ov 101s steering committee? Yeah, so that's a great question. So, um, so steering committees are fairly typical in clinical trials. And uh, let me maybe just start by saying what a clinical trial steering committee is. Um, uh, what their purpose is that they provide overall supervision for um, 
uh, clinical trial so that the trial is conducted in uh, the most ethical way and, and consistent with the guidelines for good clinical practice. So some of the features of clinical trial steering committees include providing oversight and advice uh, about the direction of a study, um, looking at trial design and helping make decisions on how a trial is uh, designed, created, and implemented, uh, and really being a champion for anybody who's involved in the study, but especially the participants and patients. Uh, that's the key uh, role is to make sure that we're ensuring the well-being and the rights and the safety of trial participants. So for our for our study, uh, the clinical trial steering committee chair is uh, Dr. Ron Thiebert at Mass General, uh, who many of you know, uh, he's been, the, uh, he's been a, a, a great champion for us and helping input into the trial. Um, Dr. Alex Kolovson, who is at Mount Sinai here in New York, uh, he's an expert in uh, many of the measures that we're looking at in terms of assessments, um, uh, his field of specialty is, is, is around autism, fragile X, but also has a lot of insight into Angelman syndrome um, uh, as well. And Dr. Lynn Bird, who was recently on the steering committee, uh, she actually, uh, we're going through a change right now. Um, Dr. Bird at UCSD uh, has been on the steering committee to help design the study. Uh, she's stepping off voluntarily uh, because she wants to be a site and be an investigator in the trial. Um, and uh, what we do with clinical trial steering committees is that to ensure there's no conflict of interest, um, investigators can't be a steering committee member. Um, and so we're actively looking to have somebody else join us on the steering committee. And then there's two representatives from Ovid, uh, it's myself. And, and Dirk Hosner, um, Dr. Dirk Hosner is the regulatory um, SVP here at Ovid. Okay, terrific. Um, this is actually a multi-pronged question for you. So um, the first part of this is, will this be a placebo-controlled trial? And then why is that important? And then the third part is, will my child have the opportunity to take the study drug after the study if he or she is on the placebo during the study? Okay, great. So uh, let me talk about the placebo. So this is a placebo-controlled study. Okay. Uh, and uh, placebos, as many of you know, is it, basically a sugar pill. Um, it's, um, there's no active drug substance in the placebo. Um, and participants in the study are assigned by chance, so randomly assigned to one of the study arms. So um, uh, you may or may not be on a placebo. But the design is important because it helps us understand whether OB101, which is the active drug substance, is actually working. Um, oftentimes in a clinical trial, whenever you're in a clinical trial, there is an effect uh, that happens is because you're being seen more frequently, there is really an intensity in the clinical trial visits. Uh, people typically just improve for by chance. And without having the placebo group, we don't know uh, exactly what the true effect is of a potential drug like OB101. And that's the reason we include the placebo arms, and that's why you see placebo arms in many trials. It's really to help us give a baseline comparison in a very controlled setting. Um, in terms of the option of continuing on study drug after the um, uh, study completes, so that's something we're definitely actively pursuing. Uh, we know this is uh, an area, Angelman syndrome is an area where there aren't a lot of therapies that have been proven and available. Um, we do plan on opening an open label uh, extension after the study to have longer term uh, information, uh, but more details will have that in the future. Most likely it would open um, after we have our, our, our enrollment um, has, uh, initiated for the STARS trial. Okay. Um, Dr. Ricky, is, is this or will this be a blinded study? And could you maybe explain what that means and why that is important? Yeah, so that's a great question. It actually goes along a little bit with the previous question about this is a placebo study. So um, you know, placebo control gives us a comparison between active drug and non-active. Um, but blinding is also important in clinical trials. So blinding means a blinded study, and this is a blinded study, uh, and is actually a double-blinded study. So that means that um, the treatment study investigator doesn't know which arm uh, you get into in a study. Uh, if you're in the trial, you don't know which arm you're in, whether you're in placebo or active. 
Uh, and the clinical team, so the team here at Ovid, you know, does the active team that's working on the trial, doesn't know which arm you're in. Um, there is, it's important because it, it removes some of the bias and uh, of knowing if you're going to be on an active arm or not. Um, so um, nobody really knows which arm you're assigned to, except for in the beginning when we actually prepare the, um, the packets, that's when we know um, uh, the blinding, uh, but that is kind of safeguarded away uh, and not available to us until after the study completes. Okay. Dr. Rakit, if my child is in the trial and the trial is successful, will they have the opportunity to remain on the drug pending FDA approval? I think this kind of goes back to the open label part of it, but... Um, yeah, so we are looking at an open label extension study. That's a study, I, I, I know, I think, um, like I mentioned, there are not many therapeutic options available here in, in Angelman syndrome. So um, uh, as long as um, I think we don't see any signals to the contrary, and that could be uh, whether it's a safety or whether it's um, something else, um, we would anticipate starting an open label extension. Um, partially that um, is that you'll be on active open drug um, and that we have longer term information. What we ask then is have some sort of follow up so we know what's going on and, uh, and um, uh, get additional information for the longer term. Uh, it's still to be decided exactly how we uh, craft that, uh, but we'll, when we have that information, we'll be sharing that with the community. Okay, Dr. Ricky, what age range will you be uh, recruiting for the trial? Uh, that's great. So, uh, so right now um, it's adults. Um, so you have to be 18 or above. Uh, it's currently uh, we're looking at uh, modifying that a bit. Uh, we need some additional data to be able to change our um, age groups. Um, and so right now uh, the study is open for the adult population. Okay, and I'd like to follow up on that, um, Dr. Rakit. Um, when will do you, or when do you think other ages would become eligible for the study, and how do you determine what that age range is? Oh, that's a great question. So uh, we would love to start in a younger age group if we could. Uh, the fact is that because the OB101, even though we have data in previously in insomnia, um, those studies were done in an adult population. Um, and so going into Angelman syndrome, the challenge that we have as, as a company is that we don't have the data yet to be able to say to regulatory authorities or to ourselves that we're comfortable going into a younger age group. Um, pediatric patients, um, adolescents, um, they're not just young adults. They are different. They're, they are pediatric patients. They're adolescents. And so we need to be comfortable that um, the drug makes sense, that it behaves similarly as it does in adult patients and, and adult people before we can go into adolescents and pediatrics. So I'd say that we are actively pursuing additional studies that will give us this data, uh, particularly in the adolescent population, uh, where once we have that in hand, uh, we'll look at that data and compare it to what we have seen in adults. And if it looks fairly comparable and the same, so things that we look at are how the when you swallow the pill, where does it go? How does it behave in your body? How do you uh, metabolize it? How do you excrete it? Everything has to look overall the same in terms of the, um, the uh, what we call pharmacokinetics. And um, if that looks okay, then we can open the study for pediatric or adolescent um, populations. Um, we're actively pursuing that, and as soon as we have more information, we'll definitely uh, 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 let the community know and our hope is that we can enroll a, um, a younger population as soon as we have that data. Excellent. Um, how will participants be chosen for the trial? Yeah, so, uh, so anybody who's eligible uh, will have to be, will uh, basically be chosen by their study investigator. So it's really a conversation with the study investigator to see um, if your child meets the, the criteria, uh, the eligibility criteria for the study, um, if there are no contraindications to participating, and then making sure that you have all the information or, and the legal guardian has the information um, you require to make an informed decision about whether participating in this trial is right for you. 
Okay, great. Um, this is a question that everybody has been asking. Um, when do you expect to begin patient recruitment? Oh, great question. So, uh, so, very, so we are uh, behind the scenes. The clinical op clinical team here at Ovid has been working with our CRO partner to really start the study as quickly as possible. Um, we are in uh, the so the 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 sequence of events is we want to identify first of all the the centers uh, who will be able to participate in the trial and understand um, people with Angelman syndrome. So we've reached out to folks like Mass General, like UC San Diego, um, and we're actively recruiting other centers as well. So that's the first step, is really selecting the sites. So we're well on our way in identifying the sites who will be participating in this trial. We have about five already identified. Um, beyond that, there is a whole uh, slew of activities that need to occur. Uh, most important of which is approval of our protocol at each center's or each local center's IRB, Institutional Review Boards. And so those are about to happen fairly soon, and that can take some time to um, uh, have that feedback about the trial at, at being conducted at those local sites. Um, in addition, we have in parallel on conversations ongoing, whether with the FDA, whether with our other partners, or whether with other sites that are interested in participating. Those are all ongoing. But I think for to be safe to say, in the fall, we expect our first um, sites to be open. So sometime September, October area, so about another month or two away. And then after that, we um, uh, people being recruited into um, the centers. So uh, the one thing that's the rate limiting is just initiating the site and getting the approvals necessary for the site to be open. Okay. Um, you mentioned that you have, <clears throat> excuse me, five sites right now. Are you able to tell us what the where those sites are exactly, or and which other locations you're considering? So. Um, the, um, so we are looking at uh, several sites across the um, um, across the U.S. Um, and I'm going to like this, have my little cheat sheet here to look at. Um, so we have a, a fair number of sites that we're looking at. So the five sites that have been confirmed to participate are Mass General, so uh, Dr. Kiri, um, um, UCSD, so Dr. Bird, um, Greenwood in South Carolina, Dr. Skinner. Um, Cincinnati, Dr. Wink, and uh, Florida, USF, Dr. Weber are five who are confirmed. Others are in various stages of um, conversation with us, and so once we know where those sites are, uh, we'll be able to inform you. Our goal is to really have a fairly geographically dispersed spread across the U.S. Um, so that Hopefully, uh, people are not more than you know, a couple hour drive, if maximum, away from the nearest center. Okay, thank you. For the participating families, will there be any reimbursement of out-of-packet expenses? Yeah, so we will be providing some uh, uh, um, uh, reimbursement for the, for the travel related uh, to the study, as well as those incidental costs. Um, it doesn't come directly from us, but we are actually um, uh, working with, uh, it's, it's considered like a clinical concierge service that will help families with travel, uh, that will help with uh, making sure they're getting to the appointments when and how they need to, uh, and also uh, helping to coordinate any sort of logistics you may need, whether to get there, whether to stay overnight, um, anything from that sort. So it's very individualized and personal. Um, there will be more information as, as people um, are uh, enrolled into the trial. Um, they'll have all those resources available to them as well to make it as easy as possible. Excellent. Well, Eileen asked the number one question. I'm going to ask the number two question, which is, how do I sign my child up for the trial? Um, great. So, uh, yes, we'd love uh, uh, for you to spread the word and, and talk about our trial. But first of all, it's really a conversation with your healthcare provider. Um, it's, an, it's a conversation to see if the trial is, is, is appropriate um, for your child. Um, and then it's a conversation with the site investigator and site staff at the center 
uh, to make sure that, um, that, first of all, that you have all the information you need to make an informed decision, uh, and then also whether um, uh, your child meets the inclusion and exclusion criteria for the study, and then if everything um, really it, it looks like is moving forward, it's your study investigator and staff that will help enroll you into the trial. And just to clarify, Amit, those conversations shouldn't be taking place right now, correct? They should take place once the trial is official, officially started and listed on clinicaltrials.gov? Correct. So I think uh, definitely uh, you can express interest. Uh, right now the trial is currently not open for patient enrollment because we haven't gotten through the process of opening up our sites yet, but that is coming very soon in the future. Um, but uh, you can have initial conversations, but really we will not be able to enroll until the sites are actually uh, officially open. Okay, excellent. Um, I want to thank you, Dr. Rakit. This has been very helpful. Um, we, Eileen and I would like to invite you back to do some follow-up webinars when there's more information that you can share. Um, thank you, Eileen, for participating today. Um, thank you, Paula and Dr. Rakit. Um, this has been very um, helpful, very informative um, for both of our organizations and um, for the Angelman community you know, across the globe, really. So um, an excellent introduction to OV101, and we are all very, very excited about uh, what's coming in the next few months. Great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, looking forward to speaking with you again, and um, to um, all of you, looking forward to uh, interacting some more. Thank you, Dr. Rakit. Thank you. Thank you.